The nausea cut like a knife. The weight of all that fat on my stomach and internal organs was nearly unbearable. It was like wearing a corset with a stomach bug. I couldn't drink water, couldn't even swallow my own saliva without puking. I just had to sit erect in bed, spitting into a bucket, bloated and sweaty and shaking with sickness or withdrawal or both. I had to force myself to take tiny sips of any alcohol I could bear just to avoid a seizure, but my hands were often rigidly in spasm as the scarier symptoms of withdrawal drew closer. And then I woke up on the floor with no idea how I'd got there. Could you be pregnant? The guy rephrased, exchanging a glance with his colleague. They looked at each other for a very long time. Then they looked at me and both of them said the same. They'd heard something in there. Something more than a single heartbeat. This baby was too big to have choices. Everything shifted. Wow. Baby? I'm having a baby. Something in me was grasping onto that like a drowning man with a life raft because babies meant change. Maybe it was the one and only way I'd ever get sober, my whole life having to jump sideways, baby clothes and toys scattered all over the floor in place of all those fucking liquor bottles. Maybe this baby meant salvation. So hello you wonderful humans of YouTube and welcome to a very messy tale from my very messy life. I've been telling you these stories for two years now. Originally the product of lockdown and Covid alienation. There was nowhere to go, nothing to do and we all went slowly insane. So you told me to write a memoir to drag you through the muck and glitter of my memories. And I just need to jump in here and give you a quick warning to let you know that there is a tiny bit of eating disorder related content in this video pertaining briefly to bulimia but mostly talking about just how unbelievably uncomfortable and upset I felt living in a larger body for the first time in my life. Whether you want to skip this video or go with it, I just wanted to warn you. So with that said, back to the video. By 2016, a lot of stuff had happened. Stories will be going back to when the time's right. For now, all you need to know is that I'd been forced to quit heroin in 2012 as my body was just too shot, not my veins, my whole fucking system. I couldn't even smoke the stuff. And a year later, my health was flushed irrevocably down the shitter by an unfortunate event we'll get to soon. And these things, I think, were the real precursors of my alcoholism. Without heroin, I had no coping mechanism. And part of my ghastly new health issues meant being put on beta blockers. I felt groggy, brain foggy, uninspired, and I gained weight like I never had before in my life. This was something my post-eating disorder brain straight up could not handle. I'd been recovered more or less for years, but I was still effortlessly underweight. And it's so fucking easy to be recovered when your body stays underweight. Like you don't have to face any of the difficult bits of recovery. I assumed I would always be underweight like that. Not anymore, not once the beta blockers entered the picture. And that was the final nail in the coffin, I reckon. Heroin was gone. I missed it like hell every goddamn day. I couldn't take many other drugs due to my shit shit health. And now I was getting fat too. My brain reared up and screamed and something had to come and take it all away. Fucking ironic then that the new thing, booze, would end up making me even fatter than I could ever possibly have conceived of. I'd been a light to moderate evening drinker for much of my adult life, Jack Daniels and Diet Coke mostly, or a couple of glasses of wine, but I never really loved alcohol, partly because it gave me intense cravings for cocaine, I know a lot of people feel that one, which I could no longer take, but largely because booze is just such an overrated drug, honestly. There's no magic in booze, not like ecstasy, nor even a good sativa weed, but it also doesn't feel comforting, safe, the way heroin does. Booze just makes you emotional, like restless but clumsy, and all your darkest secrets and most stupid thoughts come pouring out of you for you to regret forever once you sober up. In short, I drank whenever I liked and never worried about my addictive personality because how could I get addicted to something I basically thought was shit? <laughs> So always beware the sneaky ones. Food, booze, sex. 
those little things that are such a normal part of life, they're always around. Sleepwalking into addiction is so, so easy with these devious little shit gremlins. In the spring of 2016, I'd started hanging out with a guy we'll call Ian. We'd seen each other around the clubs for years, and I'd always had a thing for him big time, but he'd always been really annoyingly taken, like flirtatious, but taken. <laughs> Such an annoying combination. In 2016, though, his long-term relationship had crumbled to dust, and finally we were free to do whatever we wanted. Ian is still a friend to this day and not a fan of the limelight, so I'll be swerving the juicy details of our summer fling, those tiny islands of laughter and sex and Deadpool and sweet potato fries, all drowned in the toxic booze ocean that became that year. The trouble was, Ian was a heavy drinker, and whenever we went out, he would buy me drinks at the rate he was drinking his, then encourage me to keep up. I used to hate being drunk in public. If I was home alone, I was happy to mix white wine with bumps of ketamine and get absolutely shit-faced. But out in public, where humans circled like praying lions, I needed my wits about me. With Ian, though, I felt safe. Safe enough to experiment with the real depths of the drunken experience. So I got more drunk than I ever had in my life, and at that point, I actually started to like it. But the real problem was that whenever we'd staggered back to the train station and I got home, the drunkenness lingered on. And for want of anything better to do, I'd get on the computer and get back to work. Soon I discovered that writing drunk was actually helping me bust through the novel rewrite rut I was stuck in. When I was drinking, I could sit down and the words would just fucking flow. It was so easy, so fun, disappearing heart and soul through a swirling, boozy vortex into the fictional world I'd created. Too drunk to feel my doughy, health-issue-riddled body, I existed as a mind alone floating in cyberspace, connections sparking between whiskey-lubricated neurons until my characters were as real as life to me and the plot unfurled like an open road. Any problems I had in life, I fed into the machine of my writing, and for up to 12 hyper-focused hours a day, all my problems were rectified by the wild, swooping magic of my drunken imagination. At first, I was even writing some pretty good shit, but it never lasts, does it, with boozy writing? Take it from me. Pretty soon, the shit I'd be coming out with was so utterly, embarrassingly unusable, it classed more as maladaptive daydreaming than any form of productivity. I still have those files. The novel I was writing, it ended up becoming three times as big as it ought to be, and it is unreadable shit. Um... That, that was a complete waste of like two years of writing. What had started out as writing with a bit of a buzz became something far darker and I found myself needing that intense level of intoxication to feel ready to tackle anything creative. The old adage goes, write drunk, edit sober. And I'd say if you can stick to that, maybe it can produce good stories writing drunk. But I would drink myself stupid writing in the evening and wake up with a killer hangover, all brain foggy and nauseous and awful. How was I meant to edit or write or anything like that? That's not even a rhetorical question, by the way. And the answer was obvious if stupid. Hair of the dog. This is the trouble with non-conventional jobs. You can drink and drug at any time of the day, and by the time anyone notices a problem... It's a big bloody problem. Frankly, even by the time I noticed it was a problem, it was so big it seemed insurmountable. Obviously, everyone knows they shouldn't drink spirits at breakfast time, but I knew people who did, and they were okay. That was my endless justification to myself. Thing is, those people had either been telling me about a period of their life that had taken serious, long work to break free from or it was only an occasional thing. My drinking was daily from the very start. Essentially, it was just one big hangover from May 2016, which I remedied with hair of the dog the next morning and the next and the next and the next and the next, until almost two full years had blown past. I didn't manage to break the cycle, stop the binge, until March 2018. It's scary how fast the idea of a single non-drinking day becomes impossible to you. And I knew I must be physically addicted by now. 
alcohol withdrawal can kill you if you are. But it was just another thing I didn't have the energy to give a shit about. I felt like death constantly. It was the first thing to hit me when I opened my eyes in the morning. There was no pleasant moment of waking up, recalling bits of dreams, then slowly sinking into the mire of a boring life. It was instant. My first waking sensation was sickness, brain fog, and dragging with it the knowledge that my life was wholly not worth living. The first thing I had to do every day was buy alcohol. This was the one and only reason I left the house anymore, generally, apart from medical appointments. So fun. It didn't seem to matter how much liquor I bought. It would only last one or two days. Then I'd have to do the mission all over again. And getting rid of the bottles afterwards was such an impossible chore. <laughs> Most of the time, there were like 30-odd liquor bottles just clattering around my bedroom floor. The local shops weren't far away, but it felt like a torture trek regardless. My vision would be sparkling with the over-brightness of this rotten, hungover world. I was sweating buckets no matter the weather, convinced that I would either pass out or puke before I got there, and praying that it wouldn't happen in the actual shop. Some days I got my whiskey just fine, but other days they called me on my bullshit. Sorry, we can't sell this to you, you're clearly intoxicated. It would be 10am on a weekday. Cringe. But I'd always protest that I'm not drunk, I'm not drunk. Only to be told that, well, you smell like vodka. <laughs> I don't even drink vodka, I'd tell them. Well, it's gin then, we can't sell you this. I'm pretty sure it was cripplingly embarrassing for everyone involved. The other customers, the people behind the till, the staff members who had worked there for years and seen me there day after day because it's a small shop and there are still people who work there now who would see me back then and who see me now and who I still have to look in the eye to this day and they still remember me as this drunken embarrassment. But at the time, I was too stressed about where I was getting booze from now for the shame to really register. Booze is incredible armour when it comes to shame, and that is not a good thing. And the thing was, I genuinely did not feel intoxicated. Like, I wouldn't think, oh, I probably should wait a while because I feel wasted. I didn't feel intoxicated. I felt normal. That's the really shit thing about being a hardcore spirit drinking alcoholic. You push your tolerance so high, you never feel drunk anymore, no matter what you consume. You get overly emotional and clumsy, sure, but the good parts of drunkenness, they're lost to you. As for shops refusing to sell to someone who is clearly an alcoholic, it's not very fucking clever, in my opinion, as far as laws go, because like I said, alcohol withdrawal can kill you. If that had been the only shop in my town, I'd have had to go home and wait till I seemed sober, which could have been long enough to give me a fatal seizure. Happily for me, though, there was a second shop within trudging distance. I'd have to schlep miserably across town to the other booze place, and they never seemed particularly choosy who they sold to. Even when the booze made me gain 50 pounds of almost pure stomach fat and the woman was convinced I was pregnant, she still sold me my litre of Jack Daniels at 10am. As soon as I had that day's booze in my rucksack, I'd stagger home, collapse in my chair, pour a drink, and this was the one tiny moment of anything even slightly approaching pleasure, when really all it was was the temporary cessation of stress and sickness. No more staggering about drenched in sweat, no more interacting with people I could just slurp my whiskey and disappear into the story I was by now more ruining than writing... No unbearable demands for a whole 24 hours. And that's that's as good as it gets, alcoholism, is that just I'm, I'm just going to sit here and nothing really horrible is going to happen to me for 24 hours and then I'm going to have to repeat the whole cycle again. This is my life now. I don't know the way out of it. This sucks. Ugh. So that's where I'd stay, all day long, drinking and sweating and immersing myself in the fantasy of a different life, a different world. By evening, when I would have consumed 30 or so, up to 40 or so units of whiskey, my emotions would be a roller coaster wreckage. I got hugely fixated on one incident of childhood trauma, and it visited me like a cruel ghost every night, seeping up from the bottom of the bottle, a being formed of liquor fumes and misery. Soon I'd be so overwhelmed with emotions I'd just start screaming. Not even words, just pure, demented, wordless screams of pain. Sometimes I yelled into a pillow, other times the neighbours just had to suffer me. No one ever came to see what was wrong. 
Sometimes I called the Samaritans, slurred and sobbed all my problems out to them, but 70% of the time it made no difference to how I felt, and on quite a few occasions they just hung up on me. I'd been rambling and sobbing and incoherent for so fucking long, click, the understanding voice on the phone would just cut me off. That is a new fucking low, by the way, as far as feelings go, when you phone a crisis line in a crisis and they decide you're either not worth bothering with or completely beyond help. Probably both. But in spite of all this misery, it was the weight gain that was undoubtedly the most awful part of it for me. I'd never even been a healthy weight in my life before, let alone overweight. Nothing I owned fit me. I kept ordering my favourite dress in different sizes, bigger and bigger and bigger, until I bought the biggest one they did, and it still didn't fucking fit me. The feeling of my skin touching itself where the fat rolls were was unspeakably horrible to me as an autistic, and alcohol, like I said, makes you sweat buckets just to make the sensations even more repulsive. You know, it's slick skin touching slick skin. It's like... I've seen people talk about this on TikTok and it's like the quote they used was skin should not touch itself and I fucking feel that when it comes to being at higher weights. Being inside a fat body just felt so uncomfortable. It was yet another thing that made me scream into pillows or straight into the uncaring air, screaming and screaming because I couldn't escape this huge doughy body and its gruesome sensations that were akin to being stuck in a hair jumper made of slippery, sweaty lard. I couldn't sit in the only position comfortable for my autistic body because the vast rubbery protrusion of my stomach was in the way. My stomach was in the way so damn much now I had to take out my belly button piercing because I was constantly knocking it on everything I passed. I just wasn't used to being in this bloated to double size, utterly unfit slug of a body. For a while, I avoided consuming anything except alcohol, purging any food I ate, but the combination of bulimia and alcoholism genuinely feels like death. And I wasn't even losing weight, so I just stopped bothering. Finally, one awful drunken night, I did the stupidest thing in the world and stepped on the scales for the first time in months. I knew it would be bad, but it was so, so much worse than anything I'd braced myself for. The number that flashed back at me was alien, unthinkable. My anorexia, long buried, reared back up and had a fucking aneurysm. This sweaty, lumbering body was repugnant to me and I was trapped inside it. I had a full-on meltdown and trashed my room, trashed my alien body along with it, taking a fat black marker pen and scrawling mad insults across the walls. Most of it spelled wrong. I was just too drunk and too furious to care about anything. When my graffiti spree only fueled the rage further, I took a penknife and carved that dreadful scale number into the backs of both of my arms and into my stomach. Just the number, because that number was a worse insult to me than any word could ever be. By now, I was dwelling in a room that looked like a crack den. Graffiti on the walls, liquor bottles rolling everywhere. I avoided showering because seeing my body was hell itself and standing up was just too exhausting anyway with a two-year hangover. So I bathed once in a blue moon and mostly just got by on wet wipes. My room was also about two feet deep in clothes that didn't fit and I just couldn't be bothered hanging them up and overall I wanted to die. But we're so far from being done yet. The next element of hell was having to be breathalyzed at the addiction clinic every fortnight because I was still on methadone and obviously it's a deadly combination. They could only release my script to me if I was breathalyzed under a certain number every fucking fortnight. I had to cut down my booze intake massively the day before and I dreaded those days. The urge to drink was constant, impossible to fight. I always had those sodding appointments booked for 9am because the only time I wasn't drinking was when I was unconscious. But even so, going first thing in the morning didn't help much. I still woke up with a blood alcohol count higher than most people manage in their entire lives. Despite the ludicrous number though, I'd be shaking and sweating and nauseous from withdrawal because to my body it was too low. I'd blow into the breathalyzer and the numbers would just skyrocket, whirling higher and higher and higher as I watched, terrified that I'd be denied my methadone, and then what? Then fucking what? Usually it was okay, but only just. In the end, they increased my allowed number. It was stupidly dangerous to keep forcing me down to a normal person's maximum intake. 
my body was used to far more and it couldn't handle the withdrawal. Pretty soon, booze was also giving me these hellish vomiting fits. Not like the usual got drunk and bath type deal, but something that really, really should have been looked into, medically speaking. <laughs> was my liver starting to fail? Was it acute alcohol poisoning? To this day, I don't know. It would start like any other day drinking from sunup until I'd do a shot or try to swallow a pill and the second it hit the back of my throat, my stomach would just go, no, you fucking don't. And I would projectile vomit everything into the nearest bucket. And once I'd yacked that first time, there was just no stopping me. The nausea cut like a knife. The weight of all that fat on my stomach and internal organs was nearly unbearable. It was like wearing a corset with a stomach bug. I couldn't drink water, couldn't even swallow my own saliva without puking. I just had to sit erect in bed, spitting into a bucket, bloated and sweaty and shaking with sickness or withdrawal or both. I had to force myself to take tiny sips of alcohol, any alcohol I could bear, just to avoid a seizure. But my hands were often rigidly in spasm as the scarier symptoms of withdrawal drew closer. No matter what I did, I'd end up throwing up again on and on. And because I couldn't keep anything down, it was pure stomach acid, burning and rancid. Once I actually choked on the stuff, inhaled it, the sensation of that vile orange acid saturating the delicate membranes of my lungs was pure agony. And I couldn't even tell anyone what was going on. I was just coughing and wheezing and puking my guts up while the acid scorched into the depths of my right lung. And I wondered if this was the end. It wasn't. There was no respite from the sickness, even at night. I couldn't lie down, let alone sleep, so I watched show after show on Netflix non-stop for up to four or five days straight with zero sleep. By which time, starved and withdrawing and sleep-deprived, I would have no idea what was real life and what was on the screen. If I was watching iZombie, I constantly had to filter my brain, wondering what was going on in the morgue today. Whose brains will we eating tomorrow? I never quite slipped up and revealed the full extent of my confusion, but I came bloody close. Whatever I was watching on TV, it was packed with everything I no longer had and now missed like hell. The number of water bottles on TV shows is insane. And I know that because when you can't even keep down your own spit, there is nothing on earth that sounds more delicious than a bottle of cold, clear water to be gulped straight down. And I couldn't, not even a sip. But I also noticed the actors, how skinny every girl in every show was. It had never hit me before because I'd been skinny too, so they were just normal, right? Once I got fat, however, I realised what a warped, narrow lens world was shown on TV. The worst and most triggering offender for me was the show Weeds. I rapidly realised that Basically everything the main character survives is down to her being a thin, white, attractive woman. The privilege dump was insane. If you held those cards, it seemed, you could screw your way out of anything. And it was gutting, realising that I used to hold those very same cards and I'd never once appreciated them, never even noticed I was holding them till they were snatched away forever. Now nobody on TV looked like me, this pale, bloated doble with greasy depression hair and a puffy wino's face. My self-hatred burned with the fire of a thousand suns. And then I woke up on the floor with no idea how I'd got there. It wasn't like there was just a haziness to it, the way alcoholic blackouts usually go. Something far, far bigger was wrong. The whole day was gone from my memory, like my hard disk had corrupted, and I felt so stupid and hazy in the head. Dreamlike, confused, everything felt like a video game, and that feeling was going to last over a month. My initial guess was that I'd had a seizure, and maybe that's true, I still don't know. My main theory now, though, is that I must have fallen off my loft bed head first and knocked myself out. The long lingering confusion felt like a concussion. There was no pain, but that was normal. I was drinking too much to feel anything, and as a result, I was always covered in these massive, like, necrotic-looking purple-black bruises, and I had no idea where any of them came from. I literally took pictures of a load of them to take to my doctor because I thought I had this weird disease where I was getting these splotches on me. <laughs> it's like, no, you're drunk and clumsy and you're falling over all the time. <sighs> But anyway, no one was home that night, so I called an ambulance. Everything just felt so fucking wrong. 
but when the paramedics arrived, they seemed less concerned by my confusion and more intrigued by my fatness. The man pointed to my booze belly and asked if I was pregnant. No, I said, just fat. This was a regular thing now, though, depressingly. People not even asking if I was pregnant, just outright congratulating me on it. Every eating disordered person's worst nightmare, right? Getting fat in precisely such a way as it becomes socially acceptable for random strangers to comment on your bloated body everywhere you go. Could you be pregnant? The guy rephrased, exchanging a glance with his colleague. I thought about it and told him that, yes, it was physically possible, but bloody unlikely. When was your last period? asked the woman. Don't even remember, I said, ages ago. That was true, they'd stopped completely once the drinking got heavy, but I didn't particularly like to admit that that was the likely cause. Come on, said the guy, we'll have a listen in the ambulance. So I went outside, still in my pyjamas, and got into the back of the ambulance. Before we went anywhere, they had me lie down on the narrow wheelie bed, and one listened to my stomach with a stethoscope, shortly followed by the other. They looked at each other for a very long time, then they looked at me and both of them said the same. They'd heard something in there. Something more than a single heartbeat. So that's it. That's the reason they listened before they drove me back, before they even radioed in my status. They needed to know how many passengers were actually in that ambulance and it turned out there was one more than anyone expected. The ambulance started and away we went. I think I was still on the bed, strapped in, watched over by the male paramedic. People treat you like the most precious egg in the world when you aren't just you anymore. The two paramedics had blurred into a singular entity and that entity grew increasingly irrelevant to me. What was relevant were the calculations spinning crazily through my mind. I hadn't had sex in weeks, a lot of weeks. Combine that with how long my period had been gone, how big my stomach was and how long people had been congratulating me on it... This baby was too big to have choices. It was happening then, whatever I thought about that. Pregnancy, birth, all the scariest horrors in my world. I had no desire to be a parent and I had absolutely no desire to be a parent with the person I'd slept with. But the most concerning factor, of course, was the alcoholism. I knew all about fetal alcohol syndrome and they said you didn't even have to be a heavy drinker to give it to your kid. While I'd been drinking most of a litre a day, every day of this baby's fetushood, what the hell kind of malformed bastard had to be inside me? It's creepy as all hell the moment you realise you've been invaded, that through the rubbery flesh of your swollen belly there is a someone... If your stomach feels hard, you're probably poking a human skull. There's a skull in there, replete with hair. Somebody else's hair growing inside you, swaying like seaweed in the embryonic broth that concocted itself out of nowhere. You can't even see them, the little invader inside you. But when you grew up on the early internet, you saw a lot of seriously twisted shit. And deformed fetuses were a regular on those brutal gross-out snuff pages. Babies born with one eye in the centre of their forehead like a cyclops. Babies born with their skin inside out so the entire surface of them resembled cracked red lava. And their eyes, dear God, their eyes were these slits of lurid demonic crimson and you'd imagine that thing slithering out of you, everyone in the room screaming and puking and running away. And you'd want to run too, run away from your own fucking body, but you couldn't. You'd been invaded and you'd never feel safe in your own skin again. So what lurked beneath? I didn't know. And because I hadn't fucking noticed that I was pregnant in spite of all the signs, the monster within had no choice but to grow to full term, then be born with all the damage liquor could do. And after that, whether it would live on a ventilator or be switched off and left to die would become some messy human ethics trial. It was no sort of a future for anyone. But it's like I said, alcohol makes you emotional, sentimental, dumbed down. I was drunk, concussed, and now I'd had this insane thing thrown at me. The most insane thing you can ever throw at anyone. The creation of a whole new human life. As it spun round my brain in that hospital room, just me on a bed with my thoughts, everything shifted. Wow. A baby? I'm having a baby. 
Something in me was grasping onto that like a drowning man with a life raft because babies meant change. They're the fastest way to change your entire life. I've known people who never wanted kids, then wound up pregnant, and just a year later, everything in their life was unrecognisable, beautifully so. My life was a shithouse, a pigsty, the seventh circle of hell. I would have done anything to change it. Was this baby actually a blessing? My sentimentality swept like gloss paint over the alcohol damage the cyclops fetus from hell and showed me instead how it ought to be in a perfect world because this baby came from a perfect world and maybe it was the key to getting back there. Maybe it was the one and only way I'd ever get sober, my whole life having to jump sideways, baby clothes and toys scattered all over the floor in place of all those fucking liquor bottles. Maybe this baby meant salvation, a fresh start. There was a knock at the door of the private room they'd put me in. I'd been in there, thinking, uninterrupted, for well over half an hour, away from all the beeping and chaos of the hospital. Like I said, everyone treats you special when you're pregnant. But the head that ducked round the door just said, your intest is negative, you're in the clear. Oh, I said, as the world stood still and did an odd little judder. A fault line, I guess, splitting between worlds. I'd nearly built a new one, a perfect one, and now this random stranger had come to destroy it all? Oh, yeah. I mean, thank God, right? But she was gone and the whole idea, the whole future, that whole little person popped like the empty bubble it had always been and left nothing in its place but grief. It was stupid. It is stupid. There was never a baby. And even if there had been, I hate babies. But goddamn, if there isn't something so cruelly innate to bodies with wombs inside them. The very second you get told it's happening, even if your conscious mind is summoning up gruesome, deformed images and freaking out completely, beneath all that, your subconscious starts painting a fucking nursery. Don't ask me. I don't understand it. I don't even want to understand it. It deserves kicking down the fucking stairs, that impulse, because your mind becomes a slave to it, and in the days that followed, it was all I could think about. The fact is, there was no baby ever. All there was was a fat, drunken human with a gurgly stomach and maybe some rather inept paramedics, but somehow that tiny little half-hour mistake, it was all too real for me. It fleshed itself out and crawled around the room. I felt I knew what sex it would be, a girl, and I knew exactly what I would have called her. And, well, once you name something, you give it form, power, the ability to tear you to shreds, which it did, Because I knew on one hand that even if I was sober, I wouldn't want a baby. Not ever. And yet, on the other hand, I wanted her. The idea. The bullshit. The giant sweeping current of change that would whoosh through my life and magic all the problems away. Blame romantic comedies. Blame the amount of pivotal plotline babies that come tumbling out of books. Blame the concussion and the booze and the misery, I don't know. However it worked, she corkscrewed her way into my soul and ripped out a bleeding chunk, because that's what babies do, even if they were never real. So I guess that's most of it, the awfulness. The baby scare didn't change anything, it was just another piece of roadkill trash bloating rotten down the side of the highway. I tried a bunch of things to quit drinking, downgrading to beer or wine, but that... (laughs) That backfired when I started using wine as a mixer for spirits, making them even more palatable and thus getting even drunker. Fail. I thought about getting back on heroin in spite of how sick it made me, but I was too drunk to drive out and score. <laughs> Fail. I tried leaving drinking till later in the day, but it was it was a total non-starter because, <laughs> because I have no fucking willpower. Fail. I spoke to numerous rehab centres, but every single one said they'd take me off methadone as well. And I knew full well that I am just not okay without that stuff. Also, the idea of withdrawing from booze and methadone simultaneously sounded like a special kind of living hell I never wanted to touch with a barge pole. So that was that. I was on my own in this. No one could help me but me. It was March 2018 when I finally found something that worked. It was a mind-blowingly simple something, stupidly simple, honestly, but maybe I'm giving more credit to the thing than to my mindset at the time. 
Since December, though, I was drinking just as much. My health seemed to improve and my mental state got clearer. I booted a manipulative nightmare of a partner out of my life and had my methadone increased. That could have been a fatal disaster considering how much I was drinking on top. But it did exactly what I knew it would. It helped with the cravings. It gave me just a smidge of dopamine until booze became a little bit less irresistible. But the biggest factor in quitting, in truth, was the fatness. At this point, I'd given up on all attempts at losing weight and I had simply embraced my role as the fat friend, the fat one. If I wanted it, I ate it, throwing all my <laughs> anorexic rules out of the window and genuinely believing I was as fat as I could possibly get. I lived on takeaway pizza and cinnamon dipping sticks for quite some time and I don't recommend it. Turns out there's no such thing as as fat as I can possibly get. I gained another 20 pounds and it was intolerable. Intolerable enough to make me think. Calculate. Boo still made up the bulk of the calories I consumed in a day and I hadn't even felt drunk in months. Booze had become self-defeating, pointless and undeniably miserable. All I had to do then was kick the booze or some of it and I could be skinny again. That was a big enough prize, right? Healthy living didn't tickle my pickle particularly, but being thin again, I'd give anything. Besides, booze was the reason for everything that was wrong in my life. It was the fucking devil and it had to go. The trouble, however, was stopping the act of drinking itself. I'd gone off my shots and these days I was just having a big mug of whiskey and water or wine with gin in it <laughs> and I'd have a straw stuck in that and I'd just be slurping on it every moment I was awake. How did I replace something so constant? And moreover, how did I replace that with something that would make me lose weight when I couldn't drink diet sodas anymore due to my shitty health issues? Water was no go. It had no flavour. All I could think about was how much I wanted it to be whiskey. And fruit juice had so many calories, I wasn't touching it with a barge pole. Finally, the answer came in a mixture of one inch of peach juice topped up with a full pint of ice cold fizzy water. It had maybe 35 calories per serving and it tasted great. Fizzy, cold, sweet, the bubbles smacking the back of my throat like a cigarette hit. <laughs> it had all the makings of a pleasant new addiction. This simple creation turned out to be my little miracle and it worked straight away. After my first full morning of replacing booze with fizzy peach, I felt better than I had in years. I wasn't dehydrated for the first time and the perpetual drunken fog started to lift. When the withdrawal shakes arrived, they were mild and it was around two in the afternoon. So I poured myself two double shots of Jack Daniels and took it like medicine. Crazy thing is, this relatively tiny amount of booze actually gave me a buzz. Now I'd spent the whole day cleaning my head out, but there was no temptation to push it further. I needed a few more shots at bedtime, but that was the extent of my tapering needs for the first day but everyone is different. If you're forced to taper at home like I was, do your research, listen to your body, and ideally tell the people you live with to keep a close eye on you. Me though, I was steaming ahead. On day two, I blew a flat zero on my cheapo home breathalyzer and drove my car for the first time in years. The freedom of it all was insane. Not just the car, but my body too, my mind. I'd been locked up in a prison of sickness and brain fog for almost two years. And now everything felt crystal clear, electric, euphoric. I started to realise that now I could drive and now I wasn't constantly vomiting, I could go anywhere. So I took a random drive to a nearby castle and climbed, fat, sweating and wheezy to the top of the ramparts. After that, I was unstoppable. And I just wanted to jump in here and interrupt myself because it feels like everything goes too fast from this point. Like it was this miracle and suddenly it was easy to stop and that was it. But the crazy thing is that's not really wrong and that's not really an exaggeration. My old addiction worker used to say he'd seen people get clean in two different ways. That either things got so awful they were forced to change or they'd seen something like a relationship or a job or something. They'd seen something and they'd gone, I want that. And then they'd pursued it with everything they had. In my case, it was both. It had got really unbearable but also I'd realized I want to be thin again more than anything and alcohol is literally the one thing standing in my way 
so I kind of weaponized my eating disorder and I used that to switch addictions basically that's the easiest way really in my opinion to quit is to switch addictions unfortunately and it's just lucky that I managed to find a healthy balance with with the eating disorder that it, it didn't become a relapse it just became healthy dieting so although I was very fixated on my calorie counting and my weighing and my food shopping and all of this I had enough of a food intake that it wasn't unhealthy in any way and just the misery I'd been in, the misery and the sickness I'd been in, switching that up and taking that away, it was so powerful that it was enough to keep me really free of any kind of addictions and any kind of negativity. For like a good year, the, the pink cloud lasted for me. It was like a good year of not having any issues with anything. Um, and obviously, like, I, I didn't really tackle the underlying problems because this is the trouble when you get clean without therapy you're not tackling the underlying problems, you're tackling the behaviours and you're going, wow, I can feel better doing this, but you're still kind of chasing unhealthy happiness in various ways and that would kind of come back to bite me in the arse at some point, but for the time being, everything was quite good. I'd write till dawn, then drive out in the amber-glowing silence, off to visit the woods, see them in their full sunrise glory before all the other people came along and ruined it. I had the occasional slip up of an evening with booze, literally just two that I remember, but they only served to reinforce my commitment to sobriety. Now that I'd seen who I could be, sober, it was night and day. Drunk me was in tears all night, screaming into a pillow, calling crisis lines, wanting to die. Sober me was happier than he'd ever felt in his life. It was no contest. When I looked at booze, all I saw was psychosis and fat, and when I looked at my fizzy water and peach juice concoction, I saw freedom and thinness. <laughs> that stuff had far more allure to me than booze now, which meant I was free. All that fighting and failing and feeling hopeless, and all it had really taken was finding a soft drink I loved and utilising the dregs of my eating disorder to prioritise calories over getting buzzed, which, of course, could have turned into yet another dangerous transfer addiction, but for the time being didn't. I lost the weight healthily, at a healthy rate, aiming for Halloween, to wear my favourite dress, the one that hadn't fit, the one I had to keep buying the bigger sizes and I couldn't even get into the biggest size. I wanted to wear that dress on Halloween. I ended up having to buy it one size larger than my original small, but it fit and I went and I was overjoyed. For once in my life, I'd set a goal and actually succeeded in getting to it. And there were endless perks to not drinking. The money I was saving was staggering. And the first time I recorded a video without having a drink first, the words just came to me like magic. I felt like I could debate absolutely anything. I hadn't felt so clear-headed in years. I started vaping sativa weed again, and that really helped with the booze sobriety too as well as the happiness. I'd vape it until the high became almost a psychedelic, then wander down to the woods or the park and watch the sunrise. It was a beautiful, beautiful year. The only sadness I feel in all of that is my family's total blanking of the whole situation. They knew what was going on and did try to get rehab spaces for me, but when I went and did the seemingly impossible, tapering myself off alcohol, using nothing but alcohol, all alone, from day one, shattering the Alcoholics Anonymous notion that an addict can never have just the one, when I did just that, when I beat alcoholism without any outside help whatsoever, my family just blanked the whole thing. There was never any praise. They've never asked me what my sober birthday is. They don't know that even after nearly five years. Even when it was obvious that I'd been a raging alcoholic and had miraculously overcome it, they would still offer me wine at Christmas. And if I turned it down, there was still no remarks made. Not a single, oh, well done, or how are you doing with that anyway? As ever, my addictions and mental health issues belonged under the rug, choking in the dust of denial and familial shame. But just so you know, my sober from alcohol birthday is March the 1st, 2018. Almost five years. I do still drink very occasionally, a few sips of wine or a couple of shots when I'm out at a club, because I was determined from the get-go to prove those AA totalitarians wrong. I didn't see why it should be impossible for me to drink normally afterwards, and it turned out it wasn't. 
But then, like I said, alcohol was never my drug of choice. It was a drug of desperation, of nothing else to lean on. And the experience was so fucking wholeheartedly awful, it does not tempt me back in any way, shape or form. Even so, I drink with rules in place now, the biggest one being no day drinking, not ever. But the weird thing is, alcohol seems to affect me differently anyway now, and I've seen this with other alcoholics who've managed to get clean for a period and then have started drinking again. Generally, it just puts me on the emotional bummer from hell, unless I'm actively in a club with other people dancing, and over time I'm finding I drink less and less because it just makes my mood worse. It's just not worth it. So in the end, I didn't lose anything to quitting. Isn't that what alcoholics fear when they face up to that looming, terrifying Q word, quitting? Even though you know you'll get your whole life back, somehow the idea of losing this one thing forever, forever, ever, ever, like not even once, that's like staring at a thousand miles of desert and being told you've got to cross it all alone, no comfort anywhere. For some people, it's too impossible a task. Literally, they can't do it. And I mean can't. I recently heard about an alcoholic who quit, then got addicted to inducing water toxicity in herself. That's how much she needed a buzz, an escape. She got addicted to water. Finally, she killed herself. It's not some moral weakness or a sinful lack of love for your pleading family members. Some people are just wired wrong and or have been through too much damaging shit to survive without some kind of dodgy crutch. And for them, when enough years have passed, the reality must be accepted. Stop screaming at them and read up on harm reduction. Try to find small but meaningful changes to their life, ways to make it happier and healthier. But the subject of inescapable addictions and eating disorders... That's a whole rant for another day that I haven't perfected yet. (laughs) Um, I've been trying. I even read it out and then I decided I hated it. So I'm going back to the drawing board on that one. If you're still in the hell of active alcoholism, though, I hope there's a way out for you very soon. I really do. If you can't get help, though, I hope this can be a reminder that you're not powerless. If you're sick to death of your situation, you can change it. Do all the research you can on tapering. But honestly, it's pure common sense and listening to your body. If you wake up withdrawing, have one or two units and see what happens. Have more if you need it. Have more if you need it. Don't push it too hard, but it's possible. Throughout my taper, I was completely comfortable. None of the like hand cramping, seizing up stuff that I was getting when I was sick and I couldn't drink kind of thing. I didn't have to go through any of that. I was totally comfortable the whole time. And so that's possible too. You can taper without actually having to feel like shit. Um, and honestly feeling like shit with something that can kill you when you push it too hard. You don't really want to be in the waters of feeling like shit because you don't know where the danger zone is with that. So try and stay comfortable while you're tapering with alcohol, I would say. I leapt down from between 30 to 40 units a day to around 9 or 10 units that first day, then 8, 7. And for a while I stayed at 6 because I wasn't ready to quit completely. I still liked having that little bit in the evening. That lasted maybe 10 days, then I decided the calories weren't worth it and tapered to three. When I finally went booze-free, I found the shakiness popped up after like two days with zero alcohol, so I did just one shot and it went away. My main bloody obvious tip here is to keep the necessary amount of alcohol in the house always. If you're tapering, like don't just try and kick all the booze out of the house if you're physically addicted. That's really dangerous. Don't do it. But don't keep more in the house than you need. Um, If you're a spirit drinker, buy those little dinky handbag stash bottles and regard them as dosed out medicine. So maybe buy some of the spirits that you hate. If there are any spirits you really fucking hate and you know you're not going to find it easy to drink, maybe get those instead. Um, Find a soft drink you really, really like, even if that's alcohol free beer or wine. Hopefully soon, like I did, you'll come to associate that drink with freedom, clear thoughts, a lack of hangovers, slimming down and feeling healthy. And if you slip, end up binging, really focus on how shit you feel by the end of it. Don't beat yourself up, though. Self-hatred only begets self-destruction. Take it as a learning lesson and use your hungover day to relax and plan fun stuff for your next sober, clear-headed day. In many ways, recovering at home is actually optimal. You're going to have to learn to sit in your room and not drink eventually, no matter how long you stay at rehab, protected from all the evils of the world. You have to go back to reality. And in my opinion, rehabs don't do enough to lubricate that transition from all-round support to going it alone. 
But anyway, this is a soapbox now. Here's to nearly five years free of the most ghastly addiction I've ever faced. I don't claim to be any kind of lesson in beating addiction. I still have bad habits and dubious crutches, and at this point I suspect I always will. My life has been like addiction whack-a-mole, but alcohol, that one, I hope, I believe, is dead forever, just as it deserves. Like I said, it's a shit drug anyway. Whoever you are, you deserve a better best friend than booze. And, uh... That's where I am ending it, I guess. However, now that I am at the editing stage of this video, I've realised that there are a couple of things that I really, really should have mentioned. The first one being just how autistic my experience of alcoholism was. That generally speaking, we associate alcoholics with being very outgoing people that, you know, you go out to drink. It starts with binge drinking. It starts with that. And even if you end up at the drinking alone at home all day thing, you do tend to be kind of like, oh, yeah, I'll go out and drink because drink is your thing. And anywhere that's like a drink venue, you're going to go there, right? That was not my experience. While I was an alcoholic, the two years I was an alcoholic, I went out socially twice. One of those times was to a friend's memorial um, and I completely embarrassed myself. The other time I went out to a gig, didn't have a ticket and I was so drunk that I ended up saying to the ticket tout, will you let me in for cheap if I let you see my tit? <laughs> um, will you let me in for cheaper if I let you touch my tit? So I basically like prostituted myself for a ticket. Um, that's how drunk I was to get in and see this band. Um, so I was a complete embarrassment when I was out drunk. So I guess I'm glad that I wasn't out drunk more often and that people didn't see me like that. It was a very, very secret addiction. And nonetheless, I lost so many of my friends permanently during my alcoholic years. And the reason for this, you're going to fucking laugh, but the reason that I lost so many of my friends, even though they didn't know I was an alcoholic, was because of typos. Not that I was writing with so many typos that I was saying crazy stuff. It was that I was obsessed with never having typos in my post because, you know, you're typing drunk. You end up with like a lot of typos in there. And I was thinking, well, if I have typos, everyone's going to know I'm drunk and they're not going to take me seriously. The thing is, right, you don't want people to take you seriously when you're that level of drunk. You don't want people to see your drunken posts and think you're sober because people will give you a free pass for writing crazy shit if you're clearly drunk because the, the post is like... You know, it's full of typos, but if it's typed perfectly every time, no one knows that you have this drinking problem. Everyone thinks that this crazy, angry, emotional, mad shit you're pouring out every night, they think that's really you. And some of my friends did kind of reach out and I don't know if they worked out that I was drinking. I was really cagey about the subject, honestly. I don't know, I was okay with having a problem with heroin because most people who get on heroin end up with a problem with it. So that wasn't weird. That wasn't like, I don't know, but most people can drink and not have a problem. And the fact that I couldn't anymore was embarrassing to me. There was just something innately embarrassing about being an alcoholic to me. So I didn't want to admit to it. And that meant that Honestly, to this day, I think there are a lot of my friends or the ones who stuck around, the very, 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 very few who stuck around. I don't think they know the extent to which I was drinking. And I think I am going to have to actually make a Facebook post and ask my friends who stuck around, like, will you share this maybe to anyone you know used to be one of my friends and isn't anymore? Because I know there's a lot of people that I can't get in contact with anymore who I would like to say, look, I don't know why you ghosted me because this this is the thing. Everyone would just ghost. No one said to me, like, you've become a crazy bitch. Like, you've become a crazy, aggressive psycho bitch. Like, what is going on? They just ghosted. Like I say, it's, it's five years later now and I still have hardly any friends due to two years of alcoholism. Even if you think what you're saying is incredibly profound and incredibly true and you need to be taken seriously, if that is the case, save it in your drafts. And if you still think so the next day, feel free to post it without typos. But I was literally, I was posting awful shit. I was just, because I was posting to myself on Facebook, my self-hatred was coming out 
in like friends only posts so i would just post things like kill yourself fat bitch but i was talking to myself and i should have put that shit on private i mean i shouldn't have said that at all because it's awful but i hated myself to the core and obviously if i had someone who was just posting kill yourself fat bitch i would probably unfriend them too because it's like that is so aggressive and so unnecessary and who are you talking to like obviously you're not going to assume they're talking to themselves because they hate themselves so much but um yeah that's how drunk and psychotic i was was just i'm gonna start using my facebook as a sounding board for my self-hatred and i'm not gonna think about the consequences or anything um and yeah like i psychosis definitely happens when you reach this extent of drinking that um i had suicide plans mapped out very very graphic ones very ritualistic and very weird and it was just crazy um and i'm so glad i didn't do that but i hated my life and i i didn't want to be in it anymore and to this day actually to this day i still have scrolled above me the first thing i see every morning and the last thing i see when i fall asleep at night are the words august it ends which is scrawled in black marker pen on the ceiling above my bed and it's the one thing I still haven't gotten round to painting over from that graffiti session. So August it ends, it says, on my ceiling, because that's when I was hoping to kill myself. And it's it's a little bit spooky, honestly, still having that on my ceiling. And every August kind of kind of creeps around and I'm like, is this ever going to be a prophecy? Have I have I created a prophecy? Will I die in August? Like it's a bit creepy so yeah um there's a lot of kind of lingering fuckery in my life even five years later the final thing i would like to say before i stop waffling at you on this kind of random podcast on the end of this video um my dog died just after i got sober and i am so incredibly grateful that i got sober before he died because although people think oh my god but you don't have a coping mechanism when you're newly sober how are you that's going to make you relapse no um, alcohol is a terrible coping mechanism it's a terrible drug for muting emotions because it doesn't it exaggerates emotions if my dog had died while I was still like that I probably would have killed myself honestly over losing my dog I probably would have killed myself because I, I wanted to anyway he was like my only friend left and I loved him I think it would have been the end of me but because I'd gotten sober and he, he even waited till after my birthday <laughs> and he he passed very peacefully and we got a nice final day together and it was all it was all good um and you can't have regrets when a dog is 16 you've had this amazing life with them you can't have regrets um but anyway as far as coping it was fine like obviously yeah I was fucking upset I was really upset but I coped with it just fine honestly after about three or four days I was able to put it in perspective and go dude you had 16 years together he got this great last day it wasn't traumatic um okay onwards and forwards and I feel like I was actually hit a lot less hard than certain other members of my family and than a lot of people are by the loss of their pets because I was sober and I was seeing things clearly for the first time and I think that's everything I wanted to waffle that um yes when you're um autistic and you have an addiction it tends to be quite an isolated lonely thing we don't tend to have these like addiction buddies the way other addicts do even when it's things like crack and stuff all of my addictions have been very isolated it's always been me using alone in a bedroom always which is very dangerous there's never anyone to look after you um how i didn't choke to death on my own puke you know with the amount of methadone i was taking i'm also prescribed diazepam so i was mixing opiates benzos and 40 units of alcohol every day and I didn't choke on vomit and die or anything. But all my addictions, it's always been me alone. Uh, but alcohol, I think, is the only one that's ever actually made me lose friends. Like, I have been friends with people when I've been a heroin addict, and I've I've come clean to them sometimes and said, actually, uh, I kind of shot up in your bathroom last night. That didn't lose me friends. Um, but being completely psychotic on alcohol lost me basically all my friends. So so many reasons it's the most nasty toxic filth of a drug in the world um it does awful things to you um oh my god i had this grisly infected toe as well this just gets worse and worse right but i had this infected toe for a year 
with my alcoholism how it didn't spread to the rest of my body and like lose me a limb i don't know your body does not heal when you're drinking that much anytime i would like cut myself or something it would there would be bleeding under the skin that would look so bad because your blood is thinner when you're that drunk and infections don't heal um whereas i i got sober and it just it cleared up within three weeks and it was gone and i'd had this this I won't go into details with this rancid toe for a full year when I was drinking. It was, oh, my body was a wreck. Um, I had numbness in my fingers too. I was getting nerve damage in my fingers, which took a long time to go away. My balance was terrible even for about, I don't know, three months after I got sober. I was still crashing into stuff like I was drunk. Um, my body needed a lot of time to heal from all of that. Like it wasn't it was instantaneous in my mind, the happiness, but the nerve damage, the balance, all of that. And I haven't had my liver rechecked because I do have fatty changes to my liver. I don't know whether that is still the case or whether it's healed by now. Um, but yeah, your body takes a fucking battering and it's not fun. And there were also other symptoms I had, which were so gross that I'm not getting into them here, but they were essentially end stage symptoms of certain things. <laughs> And I didn't go to hospital because I hate going to hospitals. So I didn't go to hospital and amazingly, I didn't die. Most people who have these symptoms, they either die shortly afterwards or they need surgery to rectify what's going on. And I, I did neither thing and I survived. So a lot of creepy shit went down. Um, and um, anyway, this is, this is a huge waffle. I doubt anyone's still here at this point. So uh, back to the end of the video. If you would like to read more of these stories or hear more of these stories, the playlist is down below, as is the book of these stories, which is out on Amazon now. And uh, so you can read or you can hear whatever you fancy. Otherwise, if you would like to just disappear and not hear me waffling anymore, then I'm going to go away now. So uh, thanks for tolerating me for this giant waffling. And uh, if you are an alcoholic at the moment, I really do hope things get better for you soon because it's just fucking ungodly hellish. It really is. Um, but there are ways out of it. And just when you think there is no way out of it because the rehabs aren't suitable for you, you've phoned around everywhere, you can't do anything, you've tried all the things that you've read about online and it's not working. I don't know. Sometimes you just have to be in the right place mentally. But anyway, this is a huge waffle, so I'm going to shut up and go away now. So uh, have a nice day over and out. Bye-bye.